Now I'd like to introduce someone uh, that I really admire. He's the best epidemiologist I know, and I know quite a few. With respect to his training, he's actually trained as an epidemiologist rather than an economist or an engineer. Uh, he also is um, the most rigorous that I've met in terms of uh, reporting everything the way uh, he sees it and uh, doing that fearlessly. And for that, he's been maliciously attacked. And personally, I'd like to give Jim Enstrom a hand before he comes up. Jim? Thank you, Bob. I uh, really appreciate your kind words and the fact I'm able to share this presentation with you. Tremendously accomplished air toxicologist. Um, I'm particularly proud to speak at the DDP meeting on the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing, which was a triumph of honest science and engineering during the Cold War that made all Americans proud. In 1969, I was finishing my rigorous PhD in physics at Stanford, and I had the goal of using the scientific method to make discovery that would benefit the world. I could not imagine that 50 years later, I would be giving a lecture on pseudoscientists who have totally corrupted science in the area of air pollution epidemiology. I will focus on the corruption associated with the major epidemiologic study used to claim that fine particulate matter causes premature deaths. And I will also uh, suggest ways to restore the scientific integrity to air pollution science and regulations. If you look at the first uh, slide, it basically reviews a couple of the points that Bob made. Um, PM 2.5 comes mainly from combustion. Uh, the EPA established the 1997 National Ambient Air Quality Standard for PM 2.5 as 15 micrograms per meter, cubic meter. Uh, it then lowered it to um, 12 in 2012. And it's based largely on one uh, 1995 American Cancer Society secret science epidemiology claim that PM 2.5 causes premature deaths in what is known as the Cancer Prevention Study 2 cohort. And this uh, quality, air quality standard has been used to justify many of the major EPA regulations that have multi-billion dollar economic consequences uh, in the United States, particularly in California. And I list a number of the different rules. My calculation of the inhalation of PM 2.5 is consistent with Bob's. I calculate about uh, the US adult uh, now inhales about one gram of PM 2.5 in 80 years. And I won't go through the calculation in general, but it's based on um, average exposure, which right now in the United States is estimated at 8.4 micrograms per cubic meter. And um, this is a trivial amount over a lifetime. I'm going to do uh, J. Lair one better. My monitor uh, covers both PM 2.5 and uh, a CO2, and right now it is reading the dramatically high number of 1.30 micrograms per cubic meter. That's far below the EPA standard. In fact, the daily standard is 35 micrograms per cubic meter. So we're all safe in this area. There's no known health effects at 1.3 micrograms per cubic meter. Okay, 
key reasons why uh, PM 2.5 doesn't cause premature deaths. First of all, there's no etiologic mechanism that uh, shows through experiment or otherwise that inhaling one to five grams of PM 2.5 um, causes death. First, the, second, there is no strong association in epidemiologic studies. These associations violate all the standards, normally called the Hill standards, for establishing a causal relationship in epidemiology. There are tiny relative risks that have just been used by the activists to claim an effect because they're generally above 1.0. Third is um, ecological fallacy, where monitors are used to assign to millions or, in many cases, um, less than that, but to certainly to all the people that live in a certain city or county, one specific value that's associated with a monitor. But as I just showed here, um, if you actually look at monitors that are next to you, they don't necessarily show anything about a monitor that's located out by a freeway. Um, and uh, fourth is a reason that I was able to gain access because of my uh, long association with the American Cancer Society, which started my career in epidemiology back in 1973, that reanalysis and transparency yield no effect in this seminal study, this 1995 study. I'll go into that a little more uh, during the talk. Next is if you actually look at the totality of the existing evidence in the United States, there, are, there is no effect. Uh, this is contrary to the claims that are in the EPA report of 2009 and, and the other activists. I'll also review that. So the focus of my talk is on the, um, the American Cancer Society, Cancer Prevention Study 2. And this uh, has been controversial ever since it was published in 1995. And the lead author is, um, is a uh, agricultural economist named Cleve Arden Pope III. The American Cancer Society joined him, Michael John Toon and others. And it's based on their analysis of data, which they never released uh, from this cancer prevention study, too. Um, this was reanalyzed by a Canadian group led by Kruski um, in 2000 by the Health Effects Institute. It never did the sensitivity analyses that were required uh, to really do a proper reanalysis. In other words, all they did was show that if you do exactly what the authors did, you get their answer. Uh, but you, it doesn't show uh, what happens if you try alternative methods of analysis. And they followed this uh, up with a 2009 HEI report, which expanded on the data that was originally published in 1995. Again, they didn't address any of the criticism that had arisen by 2009, which included my publication in 2005. Um, very unprofessional. Um, in March of 2017, I published a major reanalysis after I had gained access to the CPS2 data, a very old version of this data, but enough to make some uh, reasonable reanalyses. And this showed that there was no effect if you use the best available uh, PM 2.5 data and you used all the information that was contained in this CPS2 cohort. I followed that up with another paper in May of 2018, which added more evidence and showed that, that they really knew a lot about this in the 2000 uh, reanalysis, but they didn't actually analyze these alternative um, methods, and they didn't state that there were these kind of differences. This is just a quick summary of the findings in my 2007 
paper. Um, it's a little dense to go over right now, but the point is uh, if you use different uh, types of um, data, in fact, one that's called the inhalant, Inhalable Particulate Network set up by EPA, done by a scientist named Hinton, you come up with no effect. 1.02, where 1.00 is no effect. If you use data that's actually contained in the 2000 reanalysis report but not used, that's the second line down, you come up with the exact same answer, 1.02. But if you use the data that was used in the 95 paper and was the only data that was used in the reanalysis, that's called the HEI values, um, you come up with a positive effect, 1.08. And uh, there's also additional analyses if you break down the effect by the Ohio Valley or the rest of the United States. Separately, you get no effect using any, any of the different PM2.5 data. So there are major problems in the claim that there's any effect in this cohort. So I want to go through three, the three principal people uh, or organizations that I think are re responsible for this, um, what I call a travesty of uh, epidemiology. Uh, Cleve Arden Pope III is um, an agricultural economist, self-proclaimed as the world's leading expert on the effects of air pollution on health. He got a PhD in agricultural economics from, Ohio, from Iowa State University on the dynamics of crop yields in the United States. This certainly qualifies him as an expert in air pollution epidemiology. Um, he recognized my um, 2005 paper in a review he did in 2006, but he hasn't cited me since. Uh, and we had a major teleconference in 2008. We had a major conference with, with uh, six uh, scientists on both sides of the issue that was in Sacramento in 2010. Uh, that resulted in no, uh, no action by the people that disagree with us. Uh, then um, uh, there was a defiance of the 2013 House Science Committee subpoena that was requesting this underlying CPS2 data. There was another paper published in 2013 which um, omitted many of the null results in California that, um, and obscured them. And then uh, he's refused multiple inv invitations that I've made um, over the last four years to come to conferences and uh, debate me or present evidence that I'm wrong. And uh, he's refused to confirm or refute my um, 2017 findings. In fact, his response was, study by Enstrom does not contribute. Now, if that's not an unprofessional response, I don't know what is. So I basically just don't exist in his mind. I'm not, he's not going to claim I'm wrong, he just complains. I just do not contribute. The other major responsible group is the American Cancer Society. All the way up to the top, the CEO, Reedy, the former uh, recently resigned um, executive vice president, Brawley, the head of epidemiology currently named Susan Gapster, the prior uh, head who was the author on the 2000, I mean the 1995 paper, Michael Toon, and their data analyst, uh, Ryan Diver. They've refused to engage in any um, cooperation. They refused the House Science uh, Committee subpoena. Uh, they've refused even to work with us, not even give up the data, but just conduct analyses that we propose. Um, and they um, amazingly have on their website that this is their second proudest achievement, that their data is being used for EPA regulations. Of course, their first proudest is the Association of Cigarette Smoking with Lung Cancer. Totally different category of strength in epidemiology. The third is this supposedly neutral group, um, the Health Effects Institute in Boston, President Daniel Greenbaum and a chief scientist, Aaron Cohen. They selected for the reanalysis a 31 
member Canadian real analysis team, mainly statisticians and geographers, to reanalyze U.S. epidemiology. They didn't select U.S. epidemiologists, which would have been an obvious choice. And in their report in 2000, they didn't conduct the sensitivity analysis, which was part of their uh, mandate. And uh, they didn't use the best available PM 2.5 data, which I went over in a previous slide. And since 2002, they've refused to provide me with essential data that um, showed I was particularly curious about the fact that the cities in California had very low risk but they never provided me with the data break, broken down by cities. Um, and they have refused to um, address the findings in 2017 that I published. In fact, uh, they, they allowed one of the key authors uh, who's been involved with the reanalysis and in subsequent papers of CPS2, named Richard Burnett, a Canadian statistician, he made a presentation at the April 2018 um, HEI conference doing a meta-analysis that showed a very strong, um, in, in terms that are used in this area of epidemiology, of 1.1 1 .1, uh, for PM 2.5 and total deaths. Well, that got me totally outraged because they didn't invite me to give my presentation uh, on data. They just basically uh, continued on now for over two years. Um, now, a lot of this has changed. Uh, the attitude of EPA has changed dramatically with the election of President Trump and the change in leadership of EPA. There's, all, there's been a slower change in the career employees of EPA, but one of the main issues that's come up is a carryover from the House Science Committee. It's called the EPA's proposed rule, Strengthening Transparency in Regulatory Science. And I want to read you a couple of sentences from this uh, proposed rule. This document proposes a regulation intended to strengthen the transparency of EPA regulatory science. The proposed regulation provides that when EPA develops regulations, including regulations for which the public is likely to bear the cost of compliance, with regard to the scientific studies that are pivotal to the action being taken, EPA should ensure that the data underlying those publicly available uh, are publicly available in a manner sufficient for independent validation. That seems completely relevant, completely reasonable, consistent with the scientific method. And it's been uh, attacked viciously. Um, uh, this presentation, following the introduction of that in, uh, a month later, in May of 2018, there was an EPA Science Advisory Board meeting. Uh, Professor Phelan is on that uh, EPA Science Advisory Board. Um, I submitted comments supporting the importance of this rule based on my uh, access to data that um, shows that there are uh, important differences, that the findings are different depending on, at least in this case, uh, who analyzed the data and what the, uh, uh, what the uh, actual uh, PM 2.5 measurements are used, so forth. I also submitted additional comments in August of, this, of 2018, supporting the transparency rule. The, um, Harvard um, is so upset about this, they wrote a letter uh, in August of 2018, um, 34 pages written by a lawyer of the law school named Wendy Jacobs, co-signed by 96 professors urging withdrawal of the proposed EPA rule, uh, making claims such as the proposed rule does not serve its stated purpose to ensure that regulatory decisions are based on valid science. The rule will jeopardize the health and safety of infants, children, and adults in the United States and beyond. This was signed by the highest officials uh, at the, uh, Harvard, the president, the dean of the, the Harvard T.H. Uh, Chan School of Public Health, the dean of the medical school. There's four professors involved with seminal research on the claims of PM 2.5 deaths 
uh, Leyden, Dockery, Dominici, Schwartz. And most troubling of all is the name Eric Rubin. Eric Rubin will become the new editor of the New England Journal of Medicine in September, and he does not believe in transparency. Uh, this is shocking. I mean, uh, I've never been able to get anything other than letters in the New England Journal, and it's not going to get any better under Rubin. I had a group of UCLA um, graduates and graduate students who had formed a, a sort of a consulting um, enterprise called Intrepid Insight do a statistical review of competing findings in fine particulate matter and total mortality. I basically gave them Burnett's presentation that he made at the HEI conference in April of 2018 and um, made sure they had all access to all the underlying data. They, um, they did a tremendous job for, a, and this is, uh, we're talking people that don't have any more than a, than a master's or a bachelor's degree. And um, they uh, made a statement about uh, data transparency. And this is all on their own. Um, I have no authority over them. I know a couple of them, but I don't have any authority over them. All nine of these directors and contributors voted to support data transparency as a principle and because the Pope 95 paper is used to support public policies, there's an even greater justification for releasing the underlying data in, in that study, the CPS2 data. Uh, they, they conducted meta-analysis of eight U.S. cohorts and six California cohorts. I summarize these quickly here. Um, they're um, a variety done uh, by different authors, uh, but Several of them are done at the Harvard School of Public Health, which has been an activist on this and published the first paper in 93, the, the famous Dockery paper, Dockery and Pope. Um, they come up with findings of the ratio. Just, these are just the published numbers that are in these papers. And um, it comes up with a ratio, if you used uh, fixed effects, it's 1.2. 1.02, and if you use random effects, which applies here because the, the results are scattered, you come up with 1.01, not significant. So even published data, aside from all the limitations that exist, show no effect nationwide for eight cohorts. There's another controversial cohort that came out of the Harvard study that I have not included here because there's, there's con conflicting results from that study. Um, then uh, the six cohorts in California, including the one I published in 2005, um, show that it comes out exactly at 1.00 or 0.999. And because the results are so similar, the fixed effects and random effects yield the same result. What I've done now, uh, quickly to go through these, uh, the professors in California have, in my view, been the main source of the problem. And I've put together a sequence of emails that, and telephone calls to a number of faculty members at USC, and uh, they've all been non-responsive. And uh, they are part of the uh, effort. Uh, one of these professors organized uh, Burnett's analysis at HEI, didn't invite me, even though I have um, known this person for many years. Um, so we are zeroing in on what I think is the source of the problem. That is, uh, professors who would rather engage in activism than honest science. This is important because they were proposing, the regulatory agency is proposing a sales tax, it's called the SB 732 sales tax, that would apply to everybody in Southern California for more regulations that aren't scientifically justified. This was written up by an investigative journalist in April um, this year, Katie Grimes, on her 
publication called California Globe, and it's called A Totally Different USC Scandal. There have been a number of scandals now at USC for the last few years, most of them emanating from the medical school. Uh, and this is very troubling. This group of investigators has received, from the, based on the information about their funding, something on the order of half a billion dollars during the last 25 years. My claim is they've misused this to exaggerate the health effects uh, in uh, air pollution in Southern California that's then been used by the regulatory agencies to impose scientifically unjustified regulations. And I've gone up to the top at USC and they're not willing to do anything. They don't think anything inappropriate has been done. So this is just going to have to be decided by the general public. Um, one of the publications that is used every year to promote the dangers of air pollution is called the American Lung Association State of the Air. And in 2019, they made the claim that 43% of Americans live in unhealthy counties um, and that you can prevent like they make up a number 34,000 premature deaths if you can lower the PM 2.5 level by one microgram per cubic meter. And they've got all the worst counties in California. Eight of the 10 most polluted PM 2.5 counties in California, all 10 of the most ozone polluted are in California. And what I did is I looked at the citations in this publication comparing the 2010 version, 2019, you look at the same names of these investigators, the main people that promote the health effects are the ones that are cited. And you see it's grown from 2010, 69 citation to 138, and for the USC professors, it's grown even more from 26 to 81. And so the, the citations are all by the activists. If you look at the citations of critics, like myself and Professor Phelan, we're still at zero. Zero citations. So this publication has no uh, credibility, in my view, and yet it's given, um, you know, it's distributed all the newspapers and so forth every year. But that's how biased the situation is. Um, this is an editorial that came out in April, uh, April 25th, and they're weighing in, and they're upset that uh, folks like us and that EPA, the new EPA, are questioning this. They, the title of this uh, editorial is Stop Denying the Risks of Air Pollution. Research linking fine particulate pollution and premature deaths is under attack in the United States and other countries. And they're upset at this, but then they don't, give, they don't give authors like myself a chance to publish. Why? And so we have a very uh, accomplished and fair-minded new head of the EPA uh, Clean Air Science Advisory Committee. His name is Lewis Anthony Cox, Jr. Um, he submitted a Nature uh, letter that responds to their editorial, and he makes a number of important points. Sound science entails use of clear definitions, explicit derivations of conclusions, reproducible tests of predictions versus observations, and careful qualification of causal interpretations and conclusions to acknowledge remaining ambiguities, and so forth. He also wrote another paper about communicating deaths more clearly. That came out in April of this year. Tremendous guy uh, that is going to work on straightening out the way EPA inter interprets evidence. Uh, I filed a complaint uh, in June against with the uh, what is called the EPA science integrity official against their uh, lead uh, integrated science assessment um, person staff person uh, named Jason Sachs. I don't like to do this. But this man has been at odds with me for a decade. He was involved in the 2009 Integrated Science Assessment, which is the last one that's actually been uh, finalized. And he made just an outrageous claim. Uh, collectively, um, this body of evidence is sufficient 
to conclude that a causal relationship exists between PM, long-term PM 2.5 exposure and total mortality. This is after a decade of evidence, which I summarized above in the meta-analysis, showing no effect. There's absolutely no effect. It's not a, a question of a small effect being possibly causal. There's no effect. So we'll see if we get any response back on that. So my conclusions are strong evidence from eight uh, major cohorts that um, there's no causal relationship, strong evidence that the lead researchers involved, EPA and HEI, have made false statements about PM 2.5 deaths. The EPA must adopt this rule strengthening um, transparency and regulatory science. There will probably be some movement on this in the coming months, from my understanding, that it probably will be adopted over the objection of all the activists. Um, the rule must be used to finalize these assessments, the ongoing assessment of PM 2.5 and the next reassessment of ozone. And there must be, in my view, an aggressive campaign against all the pseudoscientists that continue to promote these uh, claims, even though the evidence continues to get weaker. I'd like to conclude with a couple of um, worldwide points. There was a paper published in Lancet called Global Burden of Disease by HEI author Cohen and Pope, were two of the main authors. Even using their flawed methodology, they come up with only 88,000 deaths in the United States out of 4.2 million worldwide. So that's 2%. And so even they concede that most of the problem is in uh, China, India, and Africa, which is reinforced by this uh, satellite map. This is done by the World Health Organization. I didn't have anything to do to <laughs> preparing this map. And you can see that the red is in uh, Africa, India, and China. And the United States is, is basically blank. So this is a important thing. In other words, why are American scientists focusing on grinding down on regulations in the United States when this is a worldwide problem in other countries? And my last slide, in many ways, is the most important. And people uh, must realize this guy. He uh, is very smart. He's been the president of the People's Republic of China for six years. He's 66 years old. And recently, they declared him president for life. And his, um, I think, role model is Mao Zedong. And he doesn't care about air pollution. He just assigns his citizens gas masks and say, let's take as many of those American jobs as we can, and then we'll uh, manufacture them with gas masks, and we'll send the products back to the United States and let them uh, put all their citizens out of work. So this is where you have to put some balance and perspective on this issue. And hopefully, uh, you know, ideally, I'd like to get some support from people in this room. There are already a number of people uh, that uh, are helping. But the more support we can get, the faster we can change this around. And I think it really is changeable, uh, given the current administration and the evidence that shows this is not a problem any longer in the United States. Thank you very much.